Hello and uh, welcome everybody to this SOHA event on uh, the arts and the environment. My name is Claire Squires and I'm director of SAGSA, the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities. There's going to be a few acronyms today, um, but I'm here to introduce and chair what I'm calling uh, an event for our big sibling organisation, SOHA, the Scottish Arts and Humanities Alliance, which launched last week. And this is one of a series of, of three events. Um, SOHA is a joint initiative of 10 Scottish higher education institutions, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and SAGSA. It was established to give a public and collective voice to the arts and humanities in the context of higher education and will also make connections with work at a UK level to promote the value of shape, so social sciences, humanities and the arts for, the, for people, the economy and the environment. Um, and that last word is obviously the theme of today's session, um, the arts and humanities and the environment. Following a similar similar session last week, uh, which focused on COVID-19, which was uh, recorded and we will make available. And then next week, um, at the same time, we'll have our third session focusing on the arts and humanities and education policy. Um, and these three areas collectively constitute SAHA's initial areas for attention. Um, just before we get going, a bit of housekeeping, please keep yourselves on mute, but do uh, please contribute to the discussion and conversation by adding questions and comments to the chat. Um, we are, as you will have noticed, uh, recording today, so please do be aware of that, and if you wish to, consequently do switch off your cameras if you prefer. Um, so to get on to business, we have uh, five speakers today who I will introduce each in turn. Um, they are academics, including early career researchers, as well as arts and culture practitioners. Um, they're only speaking for five minutes each. Um, so it's going to be tantalizing, but I hope really rewarding and interesting. So with no further ado, I'll get on to introducing our first speaker. Uh, John Burnside. Uh, John is a poet and prose writer whose multi-award winning work has been translated into over a dozen languages. He writes a monthly nature column for the New Statesman and has written on environmental issues in a variety of publications um, from Nature to the London Review of Books. For over a decade, he and the artist Amy Shelton have created a series of works on honeybees. The latest project centers around early and medieval beekeeping. Among other things, John also teaches literature and ecology um, in the School of English at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, John, over to you, please. Thank you, Claire. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, in fact, I would love to speak about the, the project with um, Amy, um, but in five minutes, I probably just did the best to focus on one thing. So I want to just talk about um, an undergraduate um, course that I started teaching early in the 2000s um, at St. Andrews, uh, where I, I was originally hired as... Um, a creative writer, and it was quite interesting when I, I came to the head of the school at that time with um, the plan to introduce a course called, in those days I called it something yet different, but it's now called Literature and Ecology, which is also a terrible title. Uh, it was interesting, the reaction was, you know, really very much, well, we don't need, we don't want to move you from creative writing, we want you to, to, to continue to do that, and I really was more interested, actually, to be honest, in doing this course and introducing this course. And that, that, was, that happened around 2000. Um, at the time in, in, in the UK, there wasn't that many, there weren't that many courses of the same nature. And I would probably argue that, that, that this course is quite unique in some ways. Um, but I, thought, I felt it was really important to, um, to introduce something of this kind. So um, I tried to introduce something that within the framework of academic life at the time at St. Andrews. And that's two different uh, phenomena. One is like I came from uh, a computing background, a business computing background, and I was very much used to the idea that you could walk into your boss's office, propose a new idea, and have it okayed that afternoon and get the funding for it. That isn't how it works in academic life, I, I learned. And it takes a little bit longer, so it took some time to introduce this. But um, the basic initial structure of the course was was to, to do a kind of primer, if you like, on eco, eco, ecologically related literature, um, starting with the um, American transcendentalists and, transcendentalists and bringing it up until now. 
Um, the reason why I chose to focus on the transcendentalists because we have some very good people on the uh, British Romantics, English Romantics, uh, at St. Andrews, and I thought that was going to be covered anyway by, um, you know, that side of things would be covered there. We did later on introduce um, John Clare in particular to the course, but we started with the transcendentalists because they weren't being covered. So the, 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 the initial course well, did actually kind of slot into a gap where it fitted. Um, but very quickly, and this is mostly based on feedback coming from the students, um, we felt that we could vary the content somewhat more, and we introduced some sometimes quite surprising texts. Uh, we did analyses of things like um, the Unabomber Manifesto, which was very popular, discussing this and analyzing it. Um, John Zerzan's work, which is uh, somewhat controversial in certain circles at least, and um, I really was very keen to have people look at the kind of rhetoric and um, presentation methods and techniques of greenwashing PR. So we did a lot of work on that. We introduced um, the course under the standard kind of, you know, the usual kind of model. I really didn't want to have an assessment-based course at all. Um, that was rather naive of me. But um, I did manage to introduce part of it, at least, would be a, a kind of more... Um, creative, if you like, um, project, which we call the portfolio. And it could include creative work. It could include more politically based work, more political kind of analysis. But the main focus of the whole course was on critical thinking. And I really think that's what literature teaching is about. I don't come from a literature teaching background. I come from um, computing. <clears throat> but um, it seems to me that the important thing to, to give people in this kind of course is some basis for, for further critical thinking. Initially, the course was only open to students of English literature, and I, I wasn't keen on that idea, but it was to do with numbers, etc. But eventually, we decided to introduce, um, to open up to um, students, at least of um, SD, of um, sustainable development, a term which I can't stand, to be honest. The sustainable development, I think, is a terrible um, kind of... Uh, confusing term, shall we say. Um, but the SD students did come along um, and, and they made a huge difference to the nature of the course, partly because they were bringing fresh perspectives in and partly because they did tend to challenge some of our students, some of our English students, as, um, the kind of uh, attitudes that they had to um, what they were doing. Um, at the same time, we, we, I hope that we certainly challenged some, at least, of the SD students to think again about some of the received ideas that come from the notion of sustainable development. Um, and we, we did discuss um, authors like Andre Gortz and, 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 and similar um, thinkers who talk about things like zero growth and what development means, et cetera. So that was a really rich mixed mingling, as it were, of, of people from different disciplines. And I would, I would have loved to open the course out much more to, to, you know, to physics students and dentists and various other people. Unfortunately, that, that wasn't, didn't happen. It didn't not happen, as it were, because the university was against the idea, but simply because there's only one of me at the time. Um, and um, there was only so much time that I could do this kind of thing. So, and the numbers were limited to about 20 for, for the undergraduate module. Similarly, I would have liked to have introduced a, a postgraduate, um, a specific postgraduate degree in what we might call which in ecology and perhaps find a better name one of these days. Um, but again, at the time, there was certainly there was only one of me and um, I couldn't be stretched that thin. I also had to cover all my creative writing duties as well, which were the main reason I was there. But um, one of these days, I hope that we can expand further on that. Um, as I say, the main focus was um, on, on uh, critical thinking. And uh, that was really important for me to, to have people really re-examine some of the, the, the ideas they came in with, not only in an academic frame, but also in the context of how they thought about environment. Often many people who, who, people who sign up for this course will be people who um, are already interested in environment and maybe even be in, active in the environment. Um, certainly some of the portfolios suggested that. We had some very good work done, for example, on plastics quite a long time ago, done on plastics and uh, one of our, our students actually, as part of the portfolio exercise, um, organized um, some, um, you know, um, pickets outside Tesco's to try and get Tesco's to 
um, you know, to eliminate plastic bags altogether, um, and you know, things like that. Um, but also, when people do come from that kind of background, they do tend to accept that there are good guys and bad guys in in this kind of um, in this in the current world with regard to the environment. There were, you know, good actors and bad actors. And I want people to really examine what they thought the good actors were really doing. Um, I want people to ask questions about the fact that energy policy is dictated by landowners and big corporations still. Um, it's all very well to say, oh, renewables are good, and therefore, wherever they put renewables, that, that's excellent. But that poli those policies are, are directed by the interests of large landowners and corporations. So there was a political element. It's almost unavoidable. John, just to say you're at five minutes. So. Yes, I am just, I just wanted one concluding remark. Um, Thank you. The, the last thing we did was to actually literally introduce the kind of uh, socio-political texts into the, uh, directly into the course, did things like David Owen's conundrum, which asked those questions directly. So while trying to avoid politics in the broad sense, it was inevitable that this would come in, but we wanted to make sure that the critical thinking was at the heart of that. Okay, thanks. That's great. Thanks very much, John. Um, it does sound like a fantastic course, and uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who might want to follow it, actually, particularly in the iteration that doesn't have any um, assessment <laughs> part of it, just gets to enrich our minds. So thank you very much, John. That's got us off to a great start. I'm going to hand over next uh, to Claire Duffy. Claire is a writer for Stage Radio Television and the director of Civic Digits and co-director of Unlimited Theatre. She won a Pearson Award for her first full-length play, Crossings, in 2003. And her play, Arctic Oil, which I think she's mainly going to talk about today, was presented at the Traverse um, in 2018. She's also adapted Ali Smith's uh, How to Be Both for the Lyceum and with Civic Digits, um, the big data show, um, which she's currently adapted for digital delivery. Claire, over to you. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, Arctic Oil was performed for the first time in October 2018 on the main stage at the Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh. I wrote it as part of my IASH Traverse Fellowship. It's a naturalist drama about a climate crisis denying mother and her climate justice activist daughter. I'm going to share with you some key things about the process of writing it and what could happen next. But I'm actually going to start at the end of the process because so often you don't know what you're doing when you're doing it. I led a workshop for the National Theatre of Scotland six months after Arctic Oil was performed. The workshop was titled Just Start Here, Climate Change and What Role Artists Can Play in Tackling the Issue. At the end of the workshop, we collectively wrote a list of what artists can do in response to ecological emergency. So I'm going to read you that list. Number one, go towards grief. Two, share something rather than preach. Three, reconnect with the soil, four, make friends with someone who speaks a language you don't, and five, listen to each other. I was really surprised by this list. I hadn't expected it to be such a challenge to what our values should be, and it resonated profoundly with me and my process of writing Arctic Oil. Initially, I wanted Arctic Oil to be a political play inspired by the 30 Greenpeace activists who were arrested by the Russian army in 2013. I was three months pregnant when I started writing it, and it was a wonderful but very difficult pregnancy. I lost one of the twins I was carrying, and eventually I became homebound. But eventually also, my wife and I had a beautiful, healthy son. So pregnancy brought grief for the lost twin, and more surprisingly, motherhood brought grief for the person I couldn't be anymore. The birth of our beautiful boy was also the end of the world, as we had known it. We had to become new people, his parents. The word catastrophe means an overturning or sudden turn. It's typically tragic, but what if we also really focused and valued the new beginning a catastrophe necessitates? When I came back from maternity leave, I realized that I still, while I still wanted to write about global warming, I couldn't write that political play that I had planned. I needed to write a play about values at a personal level about how our values will have to change as global warming brings massive and tragic change in so many ways across the planet. My wife and I were invited by a family group of activists called the Institute for the Art and Practice of Dissent at Home, 
to go to COP21, the climate conference in Paris in 2015. We couldn't go, so I wrote them a letter. And I'm going to quote a little bit from that letter. Dear Institute of the Art and Practice of Dissent at Home, I want to write to you about where I am now. I'm in Ayesh. I'm writing Arctic Oil. I've, all written, uh, I've already written one version of it. I haven't reread that play. I feel like I don't know the person who wrote it. I can barely remember writing it. This is partly because I had a very scary pregnancy. My memory of it now is waiting for ambulances in the foyers of theatres, squeezing my legs together and being both incredibly calm and terrified at the same time. I was kept in hospital six or seven times for several days each time, and each time the play would slip out of my grasp as I ate the comforting hospital food and watched Netflix on my iPhone. I tried to work in hospital, I tried to think, but it was impossible, and looking back now, I can't believe that I tried. As a new mother, I think about how different my resources are. I can say that growing a baby has made me more conscious of the gradient between molecules, cells, flesh and bone, pain, birth and life, new life and the personality that then starts to become. There is a direct path between the way he laughs at the leaves in the wind or talking in French or the sound of chopping vegetables. His reactions are on a continuum from molecules, atoms and what we can reasonably be thought of as, as bio data. And then there's breastfeeding. The fact that I'm producing a material a commodity even, makes my relation to the world feel more unified. The fact that this milk has almost on its own turned a four kilo baby into a nine kilo baby in six months makes me feel more like grass than an individual, more like water than a human being. Or perhaps I identify with being a being more than being human. I'm starting to think about how I need a form that can express that connectedness with the world your own grassiness, your own wateriness, your own fleshiness. I don't know how to do it. End of the letter. Thanks to those NTS workshop participants, I discovered six months after seeing Arctic Oil on stage that I think it's actually about a mother and daughter learning how to grieve. And as they do, they become able to listen to each other as they face catastrophe. In some ways, I don't think Arctic Oil is really finished. I hope one day to go further with it and find a form and drama that leans much more into representing a post-anthropocentric way of being human. Great, thank you so much, Claire. Um, that was a wonderful reflection back on your, your own work and your own writing and that kind of call for values at a personal level, kind of, you know, really like that illustrating through your own, you know, kind of personal history as well. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn uh, now to uh, Dominic Hind. Uh, Dominic is a lecturer in media and communication at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh, where he leads the division's journalism modules, as well as lecturing on media management and the creative industries. Um, his research uh, centers on journalistic responses to climate change, and particularly the concept of the Anthropocene as it relates to discussions of media futures. Um, his monograph, Journalism in the Anthropocene, will be out from Polgrave next year, um, when he's also behind the forthcoming Environmental Humanities pop-up exhibition at COP26 in Glasgow with the backing of the Rachel Carson Centre for Environment and Society, Munich. Um, Dominic, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Claire. And um, on that note, that's kind of what I'm going to focus on today is really this event that we're running next year in Glasgow for obviously probably the most important thing I would say to happen in Scotland ever um, in global terms. And also um, kind of how I've come to be that and my, how my career has grown through environmental humanities and how really I've had to kind of argue at certain points for the strength of, of taking that approach. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been at QMU for a couple of years now as a lecturer in media and communication, um, but my journey there has been quite, um, quite complex. So um, I began, uh, I did an undergrad in modern foreign languages, so studied Germanic languages, um, did an MRes in narrative theory, and at the same time was, was working as a journalist increasingly. So um, in between and kind of alongside all my academic career, I worked as a, as a foreign correspondent um, in Northern Europe for the most part, and a bit in South America and also in the US. Um, and so I moved kind of through uh, adjacent subject areas, um, ended up doing a PhD on um, media coverage of modality and environment in Scandinavia. Uh, and then um, was lucky enough to get one of um, I actually in Edinburgh's postdoctoral um, fellowships. And I spent a very kind of happy, um, fulfilling uh, eight months or so there, 
working on um, a number of things, one of which became, as Claire mentioned, the book that I've got out um, hopefully later in 2021. And then finally, um, that kind of propelled me to my current job, which is lectureship in media and communication at uh, QMU. And, you know, I, I take lead a lots of things there. I teach the journalism and organize the journalism modules. But specifically, I have an um, honours course in global journalism where we look at big issues like climate change and migration and kind of these Anthropocene processes. And we try and work out how you would tell stories about them. And that's a really fulfilling course for me to teach. And that's always where I've been kind of, I feel I've been working towards in my career. And um, it's kind of, as, um, as, uh, as was said earlier, that these courses that we develop as scholars, which might be a bit different from what else is going on in our departments, are crucial in building up this body of knowledge across um, the environmental humanities and across academia. And the tragedy is always that they're often only limited to students in our departments. Um, now, next year, um, we will, uh, or together with my colleague, um, Jerry Aiken from the Luxembourg Institute for Socioeconomic Research, going to be doing um, a very, very good thing, which I'm very glad to be able to run. Um, and we are staging an exhibition in Glasgow um, because what we found was that um, the amount of money from funders that is going to social science and humanity studies on climate is um, next to nothing. There are, you know, there, are, there are billions around the world being spent on climate research. That's a very good thing. However, what funders are really not doing is giving money to projects that um, are able to look at the human aspects of, of climate adaption, um, the future more generally. Um, and so we, we put a bid in uh, for funding for the Richard Carson Centre, where both Jerry and I have been fellows previously, um, to stage something at the COP in Glasgow that would really put environmental humanities in its broadest sense on the map. Um, and so we said, okay, well, 0.12% of, of uh, US, fund, US funding was going to this, and it's kind of mirrored around the world. We want to do something about this. And so we, we pitched this idea for um, essentially a temporary exhibition that runs for the 12 days of COP. Um, and it's going to be thematically grouped around equity, emissions, media, politics, energy. And we're going to have a special section for um, Scottish uh, academics and arts practitioners to contribute as well. Um, with about sort of 20 different pieces, so 20 different kind of like subsections in there containing um, examples of how people are engaging with the environment from a humanities perspective. Um, and we're just in the process of building a website here. So this website isn't fully live yet, but it will be um, next week, hopefully. And what we want to do, like we said, is just really put humanities front and centre because in Glasgow there's going to be lots of lobbying, there's going to be lots of financial stuff going on, there's going to be lots of very kind of, you know, smart suited policy work going on. Um, and we thought that we had a sort of job almost a responsibility to offer the other side. So we would start to do this exhibition as a space where people can come in and talk and talk to us. There's going to be talks in the exhibition space as well each evening. Um, and really argue for the strength of the environmental humanities as a significant and important component in um, tackling climate change and kind of all the stuff that comes with that. Um, and this is really, like I said, about making the case for the environmental humanities. So what we want to do is showcase the range of EH perspectives available on everything from architecture to media performance and environmental history. Um, we want to emphasize the broader social context of climate change and other anthropocene processes so that these aren't just abstract scientific concepts with technocratic fixes. You know, there's a deeply embedded cultural phenomena. Um, and really trying to move arts and humanities contributions beyond this kind of add on or impact section. So, you know, often it would be that EH practitioners is, is, are told, oh, well, we're doing this big thing and you can have £10,000 to mount a photo exhibition or, you know, we're going to commission you to do a performance or something. Um, but actually, EH perspectives and arts perspectives on climate change and associated processes are just as important um, because obviously these are anthropogenic processes. So they are, um, they, you know, the anthropos and anthropogenic means that they're about people, they're about humanity and they're about society. And that's where the arts and humanities really comes in because we have bodies of knowledge and ways of creating knowledge um, and of contextualizing and curating society, which um, other forms of climate research don't. So that's really kind of my big project at the moment where I'm coming from. Um, and if anyone's got any questions about this or is interested in contributing, please do get in touch with me privately. That's great. Thank you very much, Dominic. I'm looking forward to that exhibition. And um, certainly what you said was very much an illustration as well of um, one of the reasons why Saha has chosen uh, this theme uh, for um, one of its, its kind of first key areas of work. So thank you um, 
very much for that. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, Hannah Imlach. Um, Hannah is a visual artist, and I'm very pleased to say a SAGSA-funded PhD researcher um, based at the University of Edinburgh, um, where she explores ecology and environmental perception through the creation of site-specific sculpture. Her current research, um, conducted in partnership with the Royal Society for the Protec Protection of Birds, focuses on the development of multi-species artworks informed by human animal encounter and conservation practice at the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve. Um, her recent projects include um, the Flow County Sculpture Series, a body of artworks informed by peatland ecology and restoration. Um, Hannah, over to you. Great, thank you Claire and to the other panellists. I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to this discussion. So I arrived at my PhD from 10 years of artistic practice, creating artwork informed by specific environmental contexts. And over that time, I increasingly sought out opportunities to work within communities of specialist environmental knowledge. These projects were driven by fieldwork experiences, sustained on-site exploration, the knowledge generating practices of the individuals and communities I worked within, and then studio-based research, building a bank of creative, scientific and archive-based sources, exploring the specific qualities of each site. And these aesthetic environmental references become my source material for sculpture and they're fed by ongoing dialogues with project collaborators, drawing, model making, and material experimentation. So the outputs for these projects are primarily site-specific sculpture, but also include photographic film works, exhibitions, workshops, and publications. Pictured are some of the works resulting from, the, um, from an 18-month residency with the Peatland Partnership, creating sculptures in, in response to the ecology and restoration of the Fallow Country in the far northeast of Scotland. And this piece was developed with colleagues from the University of Edinburgh's Changing Oceans Group, who study deep sea cold water coral. This work comes from my enduring interest in community initiated renewable energy transition, which I've explored with communities on the Isle of Egg, North Uist, and in Aberdeen. So the partnership structure and context of my PhD was uniquely suited to this trajectory. And it allowed me to extend my creative research within a vibrant environmental research community as a fellow researcher and an arts practitioner within the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. Um, whilst having tailored cross-disciplinary supervisory support from across cultural and more than human geographies, ecological art practice, uh, conservation and eco-criticism. And my project, Close Encounters, also provides a rich research site and the conservation community to work within. My field site, the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve, sits at the mouth of the River Endrick, encompassing wet woodland, peatland fen, grassland and wildflower meadow, home to communities of migratory birds, beetles, butterflies and moths, alongside mammals like otter, deer, badger and beaver. And my research aims to creatively explore the reserve's diverse ecologies, investigating what role site-specific artwork can play in strengthening multi-species connection, and in what ways this artwork can embody and communicate knowledge relating to current environmental research and conservation practices. So to explore the specific webs of interaction that make up the reserve's ecology, I'm currently focusing on two species. The first is a community of Greenland white-fronted geese that overwinter on the loch. These at-risk migratory geese are at the centre of the reserve's conservation designations and therefore influence how the site is managed and interacted with. My second focus is the reserve's nocturnal moth activity. Moths are arguably some of the most charismatic inhabitants of the reserve, but often go unnoticed as they spend much of their life cycle in hard to detect stages of metamorphosis and are principally nocturnal. So during the first year of my PhD, when restrictions allowed, I participated in field work on site including dawn, goose roost surveys, moth trapping and identification. And I continue to be influenced by species specific attentiveness developed by conservation practitioners and the tools and technologies of animal observation. This is one of the artwork proposals I'm developing from these experiences. This proposal is the focus of a newly created RSPB artwork working group made up of reserve wardens, ecologists, interested volunteers, and RSPB public engagement and communication staff. And in this group, we discuss the opportunities and challenges of making artwork designed to engage both human and non-human participants, including multi-species ethics, 
how an animal may engage with a sculpture's form and materiality, proximity in how to encourage polite forms of encounter, accessibility and visitor experience. So I intend this research to contribute to environmental discourse first as a body of ambitious sculptural artwork, which will be experienced on site, catalyzing or perhaps intensifying human animal encounter and as a photographic document, giving access to the artwork and wildlife to audiences remote to the reserve, which is an aspect which has grown in significance during this year's pandemic. For the RSBB, I believe this research could not only inform approaches to visitor engagement, but could also suggest ways in which creative research can contribute to different stages and discourses within conservation. And lastly, as an arts practitioner, I hope this research will contribute to the development of transdisciplinary and collaborative methods and illustrate ways of producing environmentally motivated artwork that values and credits the input of both the highly skilled and devoted researchers, restorers and conservers of our environment and the more than human world of which we still have much to learn. Thank you. That's great, Hannah. Thanks so much. Um, and I think as well, I know there were a couple of comments following um, Dominic's uh, comment about the arts and humanities shouldn't just be about impact. Um, so Mairead and John were following up with that in the chat. And I think the work that you're doing there with RSPB is kind of a real demonstration of, of you know, how other ways in which that, that could and should be happening. So, so thank you so much. Um, and now uh, I'm gonna turn to our final speaker, Mairead Nakra. Um, uh, Mairead is Professor of Cultural Heritage and Anthropology at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh and was a visiting scholar at the Celtic Studies Department at Harvard University in 2018. 18. Um, and she's currently working, I know she's going to talk to us about the theme of Indigenous languages and sustainability. Uh, Mairead, over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to look at languages, stories and nature. And um, first of all, we can speak about the environment in different ways. And one way is the cultural practice of naming places, which happens a lot in Indigenous cultures. Another way is about communicating meanings and interpretations of the environment with others. And in some cultures, there's what I call a third way, that is direct communication with the environment. And this can range from the image of Prince Charles talking to the trees um, to elders in indigenous tribes who have respectful interaction with the non-human world and indeed do not have the simple divide between the human and the non-human environment that dominates Western ideology. So part of the current ecological crisis lies in the relationship people have with the environment or the lack thereof. Um, today there is a general condition of nature deficit disorder where children, for example, don't make the connection between milk and the cow or between the chickens they eat and real chickens. And in consequence, many of them have a very strong sense of virtual reality and no real sense of nature. So how do we restore a sense of place? There is a fashion of pointing to indigenous languages and cultures in the face of ecological disaster. And we have a lot to learn from these cultures in terms of developing a relationship with the environment, which then motivates people to live sustainably. But we should also note that there is some resistance to this from indigenous peoples themselves, who see this as a recolonization of their cultural practices in order simply to further Western progress. And I think this is captured in the Sami language, where the word for language is also the same word for trap. And I think as humanity scholars, we need to be alert to ethical issues raised in these contexts. And this is something I would like Saha in particular to look at. Green storytelling or environmental storytelling may be another way of restoring the relationship with and respect for the environment. The key principles of environmental storytelling, which are shown here in this slide, are about the mutual relationships between humans and the natural environment, and also about breaking down that divide between human and non-human. So really in my final slide, I'm asking questions rather than offering answers. Is there something in language, poetry, and stories 
that can impact on the way people view the environment. What can stories do for our world environment that won't otherwise happen? And how do we ensure that such processes are ethical? The overarching question is, how can arts and humanities contribute to the sustainability agenda? And if they are not involved, will it be impossible to achieve? Thank you. Less than five minutes. It was, Marie, you caught me on the hop. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could certainly have listened well to all of them, for, to all of you for more than your allotted time, but uh, certainly that uh, that was fascinating, that, that uh, revelation about the word for language and being the same as the word for trap in Sami and that, you know, you're urging for us uh, to think ethically as well as sustainably um, is really important there. Um, we have, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to all five of our speakers. We do have approximately uh, 10 minutes left for, um, for the conversation, questions to particular speakers, more general questions. Um, speakers, if you have questions for each other or reflections, having heard each other's um, talks, please do, please do um, contribute those as, as well. Um, is there anyone who would like to kick off? If not, I will uh, start off myself. Um, uh, Mairead, please. Uh, I have a question. I mean, all of us here today are here for the same reason, and that is that we believe arts and humanities can contribute to the sustainability agenda. And at the same time, we also are very aware of the fact that arts and humanities are typically the add-on to a science or even social science grant. So in a sense, we're all speaking to the converted here. And I'm wondering how does one speak to the non-converted? How does one evidence, convince people who don't really value arts and humanities that it, it is absolutely necessary for the sustainability agenda? Um, I, can, I can maybe speak to that if, if I can. Um, being someone who teaches at a university that is very much focused on what the Scottish government calls the skills agenda, and this kind of um, idea that all knowledge should be practical and implementable and essentially that students can take it into the workplace. Um, I've had to kind of, I think, argue, not just hard, but in quite nuanced ways to, to make people understand the worth of studying the kind of stuff we're doing on a course. So, you know, the, assess the students on my course for their assessment, they write long-form journalism rather than essays. But in doing that, they have to think reflexively about their own position, they have to think about the society they live in, all of this stuff. And so what I was able to do there was essentially take what was supposed to be a practical course and then give it some kind of deeper meaning. Well, that was my intention, at least. And then as part of that, have been able to get students to start to examine these ideas and also been able to argue, you know, on a kind of divisional level that this kind of education or this kind of knowledge is as useful and as is important to graduates as anything that is going to help them get, you know, skills focused jobs. Thanks very much, Dominic. Um, Claire, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, because I'm just thinking with the work that, that you did with your play and then taking it out in the workshop and those kind of wonderful kind of broad responses that you, you received back. Um, so the question is, how, how can we prove the value of arts and cultural practice to... Well, I, I think also kind of preaching to the non-converted rather than the converted, which we are. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose my first response is sort of going to the emotional um, because that's something that we all share, even if our practice is particularly rational, particularly logical. If we're kind of identified primarily in our workplace as scientists, we still have families, we still have, you know, mental health, we still have physical health. All of those things can be appealed to, I think. Um, in, obviously, everybody takes those you know, everybody has different ways of thinking about their sort of emotional life, their interiority, but we all have an interiority, I suppose, unless we're very unlucky. Um, so I guess that's what I would say would be my first sort of starting point when trying to convince people that the arts are of value. Interestingly, I'm working with lots of computer scientists at the moment um, with my work with the Civic Digits, and it's something that comes up a lot where I start projects saying, 
so what's the emotional impact of getting this wrong? And they're like, I haven't considered that. But as we go on, it becomes very clear that there are big emotional consequences to any learning and any sort of endeavour. So I guess that's kind of where I'm making my sort of initial contribution. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Claire. Um, John, were you going to add something on to that as well? Um, yeah, yeah, speaking as a former computer person, although I was working in business rather than um, academic life, um, I think the problem is, I think we need to change the culture. Um, I, when I lived in Berlin, I, I spent some time at the Potsdam Institute where um, some of the most interesting um, climate change research is happening in the world and the the director of the institute said to me directly um we know the science we don't need to do any more work on the science the science is done we recognize that we need to com communicate what 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 the problems are and what the science indicates and so the scientists and, and certainly computer people and and people from all kind of walks of of different professions i think understand that the problems are urgent and that we can contribute to it the trouble is that in the culture, we have an entrepreneurial culture. So if I, if I propose some kind of idea, if I can make an app out of it or I can make some kind of business spin-off out of it, I'll get funding to do it and, and, and employ some people and, and that kind of thing. I'm not really interested in doing something entrepreneurial. Um, the very essence of my, my response to the current society, current culture is, but the entrepreneurial side of it, the development side of it, the, the capitalist side of it, as it were, is what the problem is. So um, I think what we need to do is change the culture. And I think the first step is to be completely unapologetic about saying things like, you know, I don't need to prove to anybody or demonstrate to anybody in any other profession that the arts are important. Um, I believe that human beings are on this earth to make culture um, and everything else is incidental to that. So I think the essence, the central thing is a kind of revolutionary, if you like. Um, we need to actually alter the culture in, in very profound ways. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Hannah, you've got your hand up. I don't know if you've seen the question in the chat for you as well. I'll just read it out in case people haven't read it. Um, so this is from Althea as a natural scientist with arts and humanities overlap via environmental history and environmental ecology. I think it might be partly explaining to the uncertain rather than the unconverted. And she'd be, Althea will be interested to hear how the RSPB has responded to your work, Hannah. So Hannah. Great, thank you for that question. And I will um, come to it, but just before that, I wanted to, to respond also to, to Marie's question and, and say that um, I have often been asked about how to, to prove in some way how an experience of an artwork can transform um, or create pro-environmental behaviours. And it's a very difficult thing and a problematic thing, particularly as an artist, to try and um, to prove in any way. But I know that myself, that my behaviour towards the world has been shaped by experiences of artwork. And I think that um, a lot of people, scientists included, have had their, their behavior and their view of the world shaped by what they read, particular um, kind of key, keystone books and experiences. So, so I think that's something that we all share in common and speaks of the, the power of the arts in, in, in shaping our, our environmental perception. And um, to go to Althea's question, um, I've had I've had great experiences working um, with the RSPB. Before I did my PhD, I was working uh, with the RSPB up in Forsenard in the Flow Country, and I think that um, these projects, longer term projects, are always a case of building relationships and, and really understanding what people are doing and putting time into into um, appreciating that before you you bring something to it. So they come out of long discourses and, and I think it's once you get past an initial stage where perhaps there's an expectation that you will illustrate something or be added on to the end of something as a, as a last flourish, once, once you move past that then and become kind of part of the, a working team. And this is what I'm trying to uh, nourish by making a working group in, in my current PhD project. Uh, with the RSPB is to is to credit their input over a sustained period and, and for it to be an ongoing dialogue and, and I still speak with the marine biologists and the 
peatland scientists that I worked with years ago, and I'm still interested in their work as they're interested in mine. Great, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, we are unfortunately, and all too rapidly, and in a not unforeseen way, at our 45 minutes already. I know we could continue this conversation. I certainly have plenty of other questions that I want to ask our speakers. Um, but just to say uh, thank you to all five, five of our speakers, John, uh, Claire, Dominic, um, Hannah, and Mairead. Um, Thank you so much for, for wonderful uh contributions and I'm sure this is a conversation and a debate um, and a creativity that's going to continue uh, I hope with Saha as well. Um, we do have at the same time next week um, as I mentioned right at the beginning uh, one more event and my colleague Catherine has put the details in the chat so do follow um, and register for that event on uh, the arts and humanity and education policy. Um, thank you once again to all our speakers and uh, thanks everybody for coming and joining us. <laughs>